Hello everyone, this is Emily and today we're going to be talking about ventricular septal defects. So, let's start with some MCQs to see how our knowledge is at the moment. Question 1. Is a VSD a cyanotic or an acyanotic heart defect? A. Acyanotic B. Cyanotic C. Both Think about whether it would, be caused, whether it would cause a left to right or a right to left shunt. The answer is A, acyanotic. A ventricular septal defect is an acyanotic heart defect, although it can progress to a cyanotic if not treated. Question two, what murmur does a VSD present with? Is it A, continuous, B, ejection systolic, C, hollow systolic, or D, mid systolic? Think about whether it's in systole, diastole, or continuous. The answer is C. Holosystolic. A VSD murmur can be heard throughout all of systole, and that's what hollow means. Question 3. What is the gold standard investigation for diagnosing a VSD? Is it A. Chest X ray, B. Pulse oximetry, C. ECG, or D. Echocardiogram? Think about each investigation and what it would show and try and relate that problem to what a VSD would present with. The answer is D, echocardiogram. So today we're going to be talking about ventricular septal defects. What are they? What are the symptoms and history? Investigations and different differential diagnosis, clinical examinations and OSCE tips. And then we're going to summarise and go back over the MCQs to see whether we've learned anything. So, what is a ventricular septal defect? It's a congenital or acquired acyanotic heart defect. It's a defect in the intraventricular septum which allows shunting of blood between the left and right ventricles instead of out through the pulmonary arteries and the aorta. It's the most common congenital heart defect and it's due to the failure of fusion between membranes and muscular ridge. So, as we can see here, the developing heart, here's the endocardial cushion, here is the apex of the heart, here's the muscular ridge. This is a VSD where this should have joined. It causes a left to right shunt because the pressure is higher on the left side of the heart, so in the left ventricle, so it causes oxygenated blood to move into the right ventricle where the deoxygenated blood is. This means that only oxygenated blood goes around the body, so there's no cyanosis. That's why it's an acyanotic heart defect. So this is normal heart. The blood normally comes into the right atrium, through the right ventricle, into the pulmonary artery, into the lungs and into the left atrium, left ventricle, and into the aorta. However, when there's a ventricular septal defect, when the blood re-enters the heart into the right atrium, goes into the right ventricle, it can go into the aorta, or it can move back into the left ventricle and goes to the lungs again. Cyanotic versus acyanotic heart defects. Acyanotic are left to right shunts, so this includes a VSD, which we're talking about now, persistent ductus arteriosus, or patent ductus arteriosus, and atrial septal defects. You can also have an acyanotic heart defect if there's an outflow obstruction, such as pulmonary stenosis or aortic stenosis, or coarctation of the aorta. When there's a cyanotic defect, that is caused by deoxygenated blood going around the body, so this can be caused by the tetralogy of fallot or transposition of the great arteries. Here are some presentations. If it's an acyanotic heart defect, you could become breathless or you can also be asymptomatic. It depends on the size of the, um, of the defect. If it's a cyanotic um, heart defect, then the patient will normally exhibit cyanosis and so they will look blue. Um, if there's an outflow obstruction in a well child, they may be asymptomatic. If they're sick, however, they can collapse with shock. 
So what's Isenmenger's syndrome? This can develop in babies with large VSDs where diagnosis and treatment's delayed. There is increased blood in the right ventricle which causes pulmonary hypertension. This creates higher pressures in the right ventricle and the shunt switches from left to right to right to left. So, can you work out why the increased blood in the right ventricle causes pulmonary hypertension? It's because there's an increased pressure in the right ventricle which leads to increased pressure in the pulmonary arteries and therefore an increased pressure in the lungs themselves. When that happens, the pressure changes from being a lower pressure in the right ventricle and higher in the left ventricle to being higher in the right ventricle and so the blood goes back into the left ventricle. This ends up with the blood mixing and so deoxygenated blood goes into the oxygenated side on the left ventricle through the aorta and round the rest of the body leading to cyanosis. Here we can see it comes the other way now because the pressure is increased here and then goes to the body mixed with the oxygenated blood. So what symptoms will we see with a VSD? It really depends on the size of the defect. If there's a small defect, the patient could be asymptomatic. There can be normal growth and it's often noticed because of a systolic murmur during a routine exam. If it's moderate, there may be some effect in feeding and a little bit of um, failure to thrive. The patient may also be short of breath and normally the symptoms of a moderate sized VSD will be noticed within two or three months because pulmonary vascular resistance decreases causing an increase in right, left to right shunting. If it's a large VSD, there can be severe failure to thrive and really poor feeding. <clears throat> Excuse me. The patient will be short of breath, sweaty and pale with feeds, frequent chest infections, really easily fatigued and ta also tachymoneic. The symptoms are really similar to congestive heart failure. Let's take a look at history and see whether you can pick out the key points that will help you diagnose this patient. An infant is noted at birth to have a cardiac murmur. Examination reveals a systolic murmur at left sternal border with no clinical evidence of heart failure. Or an infant presents with symptoms of shortness of breath on exertion and failure to thrive. Examination reveals systolic murmur at left sternal border and signs of congestive heart failure. In history for, for Eisenmenger syndrome is a patient presents with central cyanosis, may have clubbing, evidence of heart failure and a history of recurrent pulmonary infections. This can be acquired from trauma, for example an MI, and can present immediately or be delayed and the severity of symptoms depends on size. So a third of babies with Down syndrome also have a VSD, there's a really strong association. So what investigations would we do to diagnose VSD? First of all, pulse oximetry is really important to assess the perfusion of the patient. Then we could do an echocardiogram. This is the gold standard diagnostic test as you can visualize the size, location and severity of the VSD. A chest x-ray to look for cardiomegaly and pulmonary edema if it's severe, although this can be normal with small VSDs. An ECG can show left or bilateral ventricular hypertrophy, but it can also be normal. So what differential diagnosis do we think we're gonna have with this? Mitral regurge, it has a similar hollow systolic murmur in the same region, so you need to do an echocardiogram to differentiate. Tricuspid regurge has an increase in murmur intensity with inspiration, Cavallo sign, so that's how you can tell the difference. An ASD, so the murmur will be slightly higher up, just think about the physiology of the heart, and is mid or ejection systolic, not hollow systolic. Patent ductus arteriosus will be a continuous murmur, not a hollow systolic murmur. Tetralogy of Fallot, the symptoms are very severe and normally more severe than with a VSD. Clinical examination. On inspection, the patient will appear undernourished due to fatigue when feeding and there may be sweat on the forehead. Palpitation, raised pulse rate, 
and there may be a thrill in the left sternal border, hepatomegaly if there's heart failure present, oscillation, holosystolic aka pansystolic blowing murmur in left parasternal region. The loudness of a murmur is inversely proportionate to the size of the defect, so the bigger the defect, the smaller the murmur. OSCE tips. Know the differences between cyanotic and acyanotic heart defect presentations and remember the grading system for murmur classifications. The VSD murmur is heard loudest over the left sternal border. Here we've got the murmur grades. As you can see, there's six grades. The first three have no thrill and the last three do have a thrill. So they become more severe as you go. So grade one is very faint, not heard in all positions. So normally you'd need to be an expert in order to hear this kind of murmur and also there's no thrill, palpated. Grade two, soft murmur heard in all positions. Again, you'd probably need a bit of experience to hear a grade two murmur. Grade three, loud, no thrill. This is when you may start to hear it just with your um, stethoscope if you're say an F1 or F2 doctor. Grade four, this is loud with a palpable thrill. Grade five can be heard even if the stethoscope is partially off the test chest and has a thrill. And grade six, heard with the stethoscope completely off the chest with a thrill. So in summary guys, we're gonna go back through the MCQs to see whether you've learnt everything. Question one, is a VSD a cyanotic or an acyanotic heart defect? A, acyanotic, B, cyanotic, C, both. Think about whether it be a left to right or a right to left shunt. It's acyanotic. Question two, what murmur does VSD present with? A, continuous, B, ejection systolic, C, hollow systolic, or D, mid systolic? What do we think, guys? It's C, hollow systolic. And question three, what is the gold standard investigation for diagnosing VSD? Is it a chest x-ray, pulse oximetry, ECG, or echocardiogram? It's echocardiogram. Well done, guys. We've come to the end of the presentation now. I really hope it's been helpful. Please come back for more re uh, revision materials and fun. <laughs> okay, bye.